Well, do you remember what you got for Christmas last year? Yeah, me either. <laughs> Sorry, honey, <laughs> you're over in the fellowship hall. <laughs> I, I, it's easy to forget, right? Easy to forget what you got last year. It's easy to forget what you, what you gave. Such is the nature of, of life and gifts. If you're a child of God here this morning, the Heavenly Father has lavished on you many, many gifts, innumerable gifts. We've been rehearsing some of them and reminding ourselves of some of them, just some of them in the month of December, thinking about presents that the Lord has given us, these free unmerited gifts, and lavished is the right word, isn't it? Poured out. I mean, it feels like we're standing under a waterfall, and they just never stop. And just like it's easy to forget what you got for Christmas last year, sadly, it's easy for us to forget what our Heavenly Father has given us. It's easy to take them for granted. It's easy to overlook them. And so all month leading up to Incarnation Day, I've been in the reminder business. If you're a believer, you probably haven't heard anything particularly new as we've rehearsed these gifts. If you're an unbeliever, I want you to understand that this is the standing offer that God is making himself into your life. A standing offer for you to lay down your weapons of war against God, turn from your sin, and come to cast your weary soul on the Lord Jesus Christ, who promised whoever comes to him, he will save them, he will receive them. Jesus himself said, if you are weary, if you are burdened from the burden of sin, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. So this is a, a twofold operation going on here. For the believer, it's the reminder business. For the unbeliever, for the unsaved, it's the offer business, the standing offer. We've been doing this now for a few weeks. This is part three, the gifts of God. And so far, we have seen six gifts. And I want to remind us of those and rehearse those just for a moment. Number one of these gifts was, of course, the gift of gifts, the greatest gift possible, Christ himself. And when I say Christ himself here, what I really mean is the person, of course, of Christ and the work of Christ. God's gift of Christ to the world, his perfect life, his atoning death, his burial, victorious resurrection, his, his witnessed ascension back into heaven. He is the, God's greatest gift possible because he is God himself in human flesh, Christ himself. Number two then, Christ, his person and work, makes possible for the next gift a brand new heart. God gives a brand new heart, takes out the heart of stone, gives us a heart of flesh as he promised in the new covenant. All based on the, again, the atonement of Christ. It is this new heart then that leads to the next two gifts, repentance and faith. Only the new heart can repent. Only the new heart can believe in Christ in a saving way. God grants repentance and God gives the gift of faith so that we might repent and believe on Christ, believe in Christ. As we saw Friday night, the simple gospel message is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. You put those two things together, number, number three and four, and you have conversion. You have conversion. That gift, gifts three and four, then lead to gifts five and six. Once we have repented and believed in Christ, we receive the gift of, number five, Christ's own righteousness. It's a cloak of righteousness. It's a robe of righteousness covering our sin and allowing God to see us as he sees Christ. So if you're in Christ this morning, you're justified, you have the standing of Jesus. Five and six go together. He not only fills our empty bank account with his own righteousness, but he takes away our debt, and that is the burden of our sin, and he forgives the sin, and he forgives the guilt of the sin. You put number five and six together, and it's justification. So we have Christ, the new heart, conversion, justification. These are the first six gifts that we have rehearsed together Today we come to the conclusion of this series, gifts 7, 8, and 9, and we begin with, next on the list, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. So, looking at this verse, Ezekiel 36, obviously the Old Testament, obviously a prophet. This is a promise of God through the prophet Ezekiel of what he would do in the new covenant to come. 
And so the tenses of the verbs are future tense, as God is making this promise hundreds of years before Christ came. God said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. There's the plain promise, the plain indication there that the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's own spirit, is something that God puts within us in the new covenant. And because he gives us that new heart and puts his enabling, empowering spirit within us, look at the next phrase, God himself here, though he never violates our will, though he never sets aside our volition, though we never become puppets on a string or robots, God himself causes us to walk in his statutes. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. There's no way a sinner walks in God's statutes from internally and externally unless God is behind the scenes working and causing this to happen. And he does it, obviously, by the spirit that he puts in us. And he says, once you have this spirit, not that you will do this perfectly, but God will cause you to be careful. I love that word. We will be careful to observe his ordinances his laws, his commands, his wills, his wishes for our lives. Next verse related to this gift of the Holy Spirit comes from the mouth of Jesus in John 14. I will ask the Father, Jesus said. This is right before he went to the cross in John 14, 15, 16, this great passage uh, on Jesus' words to to the 11 before the crucifixion. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Jesus was the first helper the Father gave, and now he's going to give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Who is it? That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. Critical language, critical prepositions there. So, under the old covenant, which was in place as Jesus spoke these words to the disciples. They had known the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament, right? He's even there in creation. The people of God have known the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He was regenerating people. He was saving people. But there was a a change that would come in the new covenant. The one who had been with them, who was dwelling among them and with them, would now be in you. Jesus here is speaking of the future indwelling that would come from the day of Pentecost forward for the believer. And I like this language here at the beginning of this verse. It's Jesus praying to the Father, and the Father will give you another helper, another just like Christ, another that comes alongside a paraclete, one who is called alongside in your life to walk with you and be with you. Next verse, but I tell you, this is John 16, 7 now, as Jesus continues to speak of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. The helper will not come to you. For for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, Ezekiel, God promised it. John 14, Jesus says the Father will send it. John 16, Jesus says he will send the helper, the Holy Spirit. I know you've done this before at Christmas time. You get family members together and you, you go in together to buy a gift for someone else in the family, right? Uh, sometimes some grown kids will go in together and buy gifts for mom and dad or, or certain siblings will buy gifts for uh, each other. We go in together. Well, that's what's happening here with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son, they went in together on this gift, on this wonderful present to us. The Father is going to give the the Spirit, and Jesus says, I will send him to you. What a beautiful picture then uh, of the the Trinity at work. Well, who is uh, the Holy Spirit? He goes by many different names, just like God the Father does and just like God the Son does. He is the Comforter. He is the Helper. He is the Spirit of Truth. And on and on it goes in the Old and New Testaments. He is none other than God. He is a person, not an it. He's a person with a personality, with a will, with emotions. We can quench the Spirit in our life. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is none other than the third person of the Godhead or the Trinity, right? 
There's the Father, the Son, and of course, the Spirit. The Bible speaks of Him as the Spirit of God, as the Holy Spirit, speaks of Him as the Spirit of Christ. Uh, It begins to get really mysterious and complex, as the Trinity does, right? Uh, And and so it is with this sevenfold, powerful, creative, saving, enabling Holy Spirit And he is God's gift, God and Jesus, going in together to give to every believer the person of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing gift this is. But I want you to see something that's kind of unique about this gift in this particular list is what we're speaking of here is a conditional gift. It is a conditional gift. So Peter explained at the day of the Jewish Pentecost, Acts 2.38. Look carefully. Repent, he commanded, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then what will happen? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in in this way, in this manner, until you repent. In this particular situation, they were to repent and then show the evidence of that repentance by being immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, a demonstration of their repentant faith. And then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter explained at the Gentile Pentecost something very similar. Acts 10, 45, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. You remember Peter was preaching the gospel. The spirit moved in that room, in that place, in Cornelius's house. And as he's preaching the gospel, the spirit falls upon them because people are repenting and believing even as they're hearing. No physical action required, no standing up, no raising of hands, no coming down to an altar call, no anxious seat, no such thing necessary as they're hearing the gospel. They're placing faith in Christ, repenting of their sins, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they, too, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He had been poured out on them. Peter then was kind of called to to the carpet on that deal, right, with the, by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem that the, he had gone to Gentiles and he had eaten with a Gentile and all of that. And so Peter had to explain it later, and he did so in Acts chapter 11, and he interpreted the Gentile Pentecost, and here's how he did it. He said, God gave the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, this, is this, this aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a conditional gift. It only happens after you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. After you exercise that gift of faith that we saw previously. Sometimes when you're witnessing to people, depending on their life of sin, they start hearing the gospel and hearing about the Christian life and maybe they know some things accurately about the the standards of discipleship and the call of the Bible on on the Christian life, and and sometimes people will kind of drift into a place of despair. Uh, They'll drift into a place of, I I can't be a Christian. I can't do it. I'm too too sinful. I I don't have the ability, even though I'm kind of drawn to it, and even though I I would say it's the way you ought to live your life, man, if you know the stuff I do, I, I don't have the ability to live like that. This is the answer to that despair. This is the answer of the gospel to that person who feels like they don't have any possibility of living remotely like a Christian. We need to tell them that once and after you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit to come live inside of your life for the rest of your time in eternity. And it is this Holy Spirit who will give you the ability that you currently do not have. Right? Back to the Ezekiel verse. I will put my spirit within them and cause them to walk in my statutes. We need to show people that verse and say, this is not about your strength. This is not about your discipline. This is not about your willpower. This is about the power of God in you. So this gift, then that we're speaking of in this list, is the gift of God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit to permanently indwell every believer. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the gift of spirit 
indwelling. He will be in you, believers. And, and so for all you theologians out there, you have to make a distinction. What we're talking about in this seventh gift is distinction from, is distinct from his work of conviction. It's distinct from his work of regeneration. It's distinct from his work of converting the new heart, gift of faith, gift of repentance. It's distinct from all of that. This is his gift of permanent residence. You cast yourself on the Lamb of God, and the dove of God lands on you and stays there forever. Hallelujah. What a gift from God. The very moment we repent and believe, we receive God, the Holy Spirit. He brings into our life, into our soul, into our spirit, the very presence of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. <laughs> Jesus talked about this in John, right? He says, he says, we will come and make our abode with you. We will come and dwell with you. So in that sense, he is the gift that keeps on giving, Right? You have some gifts like that. They just keep on giving. They just go on like some big giant gift card, you know, for a restaurant. And you see the amount and you're just overwhelmed by the amount. And you go to the restaurant and you have a wonderful meal. And then it turns out you still got plenty left on the gift card to do it again and again. The gift that just keeps on giving. Think about what the Holy Spirit then, this gift of his permanent indwelling, think about what this means to the Christian life. Here, here is our help in affliction. Here is our comfort and our comforter in sorrow. Here is our power for service. Here is the one who teaches us the word of God. Here is the one who illuminates the Bible so that we can understand it. And he intercedes for us in prayer with groanings too deep for words. Here's the one who makes holy because he's the Holy Spirit. He's the consecrating spirit. He's the sanctifying spirit. Here's the one who sustains our faith through thick and thin. Here's the one who will not let us go. Here's the one who will make us holy and sustain us to the finish line as we cooperate with him. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as we cooperate with the residing Holy Spirit, we will become more and more like Christ and we will be sustained to reach the finish line. Think of it like cooperating with your trainer or your physical therapist. Uh, I've had a few surgeries in my life. There's probably some more in my future. And, and one of them was a shoulder surgery. And as you get on the other side of the surgery and you start physical therapy, they will give you exercises. You've got to cooperate with your therapist, right? They are coming alongside to help you grow and change and get better and get stronger. What a picture of the Holy Spirit. And, and sometimes in therapy, I mean, they're actually doing the therapy, right? I mean, grabbing my arm, pulling it out, moving it around. And, and they, they do that for you for a season until you're doing some of those things yourself. What a picture. Trainers or physical therapists uh, to illustrate the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. We must cooperate, not fight against him, not, not resist him, but cooperate with his work. It's also the Holy Spirit, why I said it's, uh, he is sustaining us to the finish line. Turning your Bibles to Ephesians 1. I want to show you just a couple of verses here because it is the Spirit himself who uniquely secures us for heaven. If you've been in the, you know, the dark valley of the soul, if you've been through the valley of the shadow of death, if you've been through a bitter winter of the Spirit, you've had the thought go through your mind, man, first of all, this Christian life is hard. <laughs> and second of all, it's really lasting a long time. <laughs> A long time. I mean, I've been a Christian longer than Jesus was alive on the earth. Some of you have been a Christian twice that. I mean, it's like, wow, this is a long life. This is a long journey. This is a long race. And where is the finish line? Where is the rapture when we need it, you know? 
And, and you have this thought go through your mind and the, and the challenges of the Christian life, like, am I gonna be able to make it? I mean, if you haven't had that thought, I'm not sure you've really been honest with yourself. You, you say, am I gonna be able to finish? Am I gonna be able to make it? Am I gonna, is there gonna be a love for Christ that is sustained to my last breath? Well, here's the answer to that. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. So God the Father sealed us inside of Christ, and he did so with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, as a, an engagement ring, as a down payment, as earnest money on our inheritance. Well, what is our inheritance? Well, he tells us, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. The redemption of God's own possession is the redemption of our body. It's the resurrection. It's the bodily redemption, the bodily resurrection. And, and we're sealed here until that day by the Father in the Son with the Spirit. Do you think that's going to be enough? <laughs> like Jesus said, they're in my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. I'm in my Father's hand. No one's greater than, right? The whole Trinity is gone to work for us, to sustain us to that finish line. He's given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Our bodies are God's own possession. We belong to him. He bought us at the cross, and he's doing all of this to the praise of God's glory. I want to give you four principles that are very important regarding the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives before we wrap this gift up. Four principles of his work in the Christian's life. Number one, his work is always, always consistent and co coordinated with the Word of God. The work of the Spirit is always consistent and coordinated with the Bible, with the truth, the Word of God. He is the Spirit of truth. He will never work in our lives outside of and apart from or in contradictory to the Scriptures. So, so, so the way this works is word and spirit, spirit and word, word and spirit, spirit and word. They're always in unison, always in tandem. It's a hand inside a glove. It's, it's his instrument. It's, it's his inspiration. It's his revelation, right? So the spirit does not operate in the Christian's life outside of the Bible, this is so critical. So many cults have sprung up. So many errant teaching in Christianity springs up because people leave the Word of God and say they're being led by the Spirit. No, they're not, because He doesn't lead you outside of the Word of God. This is His material from which He works in our lives. Always consistent, always coordinated. This is why in the New Testament, in the books of Ephesians and Colossians, you find something very interesting. We're told to be filled with the Spirit, and there are certain results that come from that. And we're told to be filled with the Word, and there are certain results that come from that. Ephesians says be filled with the Spirit, and then this is what will happen. Colossians says be filled with the Word of Christ, and this is what will, ha will happen. Guess what? The results are identical. They're identical in Colossians and Ephesians. If you're spirit-filled, then you are word-filled. If you're word-filled, then you are spirit-filled, and it'll be the same outcome. Gratitude, humility, singing to one another in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, giving thanks to the Father through the Son, all these kind of results. That's number one principle of his work in our lives. Number two, his work always leads us to holiness, never to sin. He is the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you the number of people that have told me they have a peace about a decision that was a sinful decision and they think that God gave it to them. No, he didn't. That's your own imagination or that's the enemy. The Holy Spirit always leads us to more holiness, never into sin. He never tempts us. He never leads us to sin against God. He never leads us to do anything contrary to the Bible properly interpreted. Number three, his work always glorifies Christ, not himself and not us. He's not about ostentatious displays. He's not about fanfare. He's a spotlight shining on the protagonist who is Jesus Christ in the drama of redemption. 
You don't, you don't stare at the spotlight and make much of the spotlight. You make much of the star of the show, Christ. And that's his role. That's his desire. That's his will. He always glorifies Christ. Christ said this himself. He will never glorify himself and he will never glorify man. Number four, his work and his presence is always necessary to live the Christian life. Kind of back to where I started, right? He's essential. He's necessary. We can't take one step of Christian obedience apart from the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, operate in the realm of the Spirit, and you, Christian, will not carry out the desire, the lust, the passion of your flesh, your unredeemed sinful flesh. The implication there, if we flip it, is if we don't walk by the Spirit, we will carry out the desires of the flesh. Inevitably. And so here we find the, the essence of the Christian life, the, the, the essential secret of the Christian life is to walk in the power of the Spirit, not in the power of our flesh. We must yield then to the Spirit of Christ who lives in us. We must submit to the Spirit of Christ who lives in us. We want to be controlled by Him, not by ourselves, not by our appetites, not by our lusts. We want to think of ourselves like a sail, and he's the wind that fills that sail and moves that ship toward the haven of heaven. We want to think of him like the rider on the horse, and we need to be controlled by the rider. We need to be controlled with bridle and bit to go right or to go left or to go fast or to stop. You are not the rider. He is. I'm not the, the captain of the ship. He is. This is the real secret to the entire Christian life is yielding to the Spirit of God who indwells us. And when this happens, when this happens, there is a harvest that emerges from our life. And sometimes we're the most surprised people in the world and that harvest is the fruit of the Spirit. All of a sudden, things come out of our life like love and joy and peace and patience Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Are you kidding me? Self-control? Yes, by the Spirit, right? And so he, he comes as this gift that just keeps on giving. God, the Holy Spirit, that's number seven. Now, because the gifts of God are just relentless. I was thinking about this the other day. Like, how many gifts do we get at Christmas? You know, one or two maybe. How many do we give our kids? Maybe, I don't know, maybe three or four. But, I mean, we're going to do nine, and we're just scratching the surface. I mean, it's just one after the other after the other. So this gift number seven, the gift of God who is the Holy Spirit, he comes to us, and he actually has gifts in his pocket. <laughs> the gift has gifts. The gift brings gifts. That brings us to number eight, a spiritual gift. <laughs> One of the gifts of God to the believer as the Holy Spirit comes to enjoy you is a spiritual gift. Let me define it for you. Here's my definition, a unique gifting for spiritual service given sovereignly by the Holy Spirit at the moment of your salvation. A unique gifting for spiritual service given sovereignly by the Holy Spirit at the moment of your salvation. So the moment you were born again, you got a birthday present or more through the indwelling spirit. Here's a verse for it, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But one in the same spirit works all these things, the, the whole context of spiritual gifts, distributing to each one, each believer individually, just as he wills. Sovereign. He decides, we don't decide. We could, we could long for, we could hope for, but he wills what the gifts are that he gives to each one. Now, here's just a, an assortment of truths you need to understand about spiritual gifts. It's not necessarily your natural talent. It's not necessarily going to have anything to do with your personality traits. Though God in his sovereignty might give you a spiritual gift that complements a natural talent or complements your personality, or God might decide to do just the opposite because he's God and he can. He may just for fun, God may just give you a gift that has nothing to do with your personality. 
that pushes you outside of your personality. <laughs> You're like, God, are you sure? You start sounding like Moses. You know, can't you find someone else? There are two categories of the permanent spiritual gifts. There are two categories. We learned this from 1 Peter chapter 4. The two big broad categories are serving gifts and speaking gifts. All of the permanent gifts, they're listed in Romans 12 in particular. Some of them are in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, but the permanent gifts for the body of Christ will all fall into one of those two categories. You'll either have a gift that involves speaking or you'll have a gift that involves serving. You can have more than one spiritual gift. Some have just one, some have multiple. It's probably, the, you know, the Apostle Paul probably had nearly all of them. And you can have degrees of gifting. You can have a strong you know, the strongest, the stronger, the strong. You can have, uh, even within your own life, you can have this, this spectrum of gifting. So you, you combine the unique number of gifts with the degrees of gifting, with the background, the talent, the personality. And what you have in every single believer is this unique, totally unique package of a person who is gifted unlike anyone else on the planet. And God puts them all together in the universal body of Christ and particularly in local churches to then use their gifts. It's beautiful. Now, like salvation, you can neglect your gift, but you cannot lose it. You can neglect your salvation and never lose it. You can neglect your spiritual gift, but you cannot lose it. Spiritual gifts overall have a twofold purpose. In God's economy, first and foremost is the glory of God, 1 Peter 4, and secondly, the good of the church. The purpose of you and I possessing a spiritual gift is that we would glorify God with our gift and that we would do good to the church with our gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7 says this. It's there on the screen. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the common good. We have that verse up there, Matthew. You have this one? You don't have this one? First Corinthians 12? Okay. Once again, we see this is the one gift that we get to re-gift. Okay, so the gift of the Holy Spirit brings a spiritual gift to your life. This spiritual gift is the gift you get to re-gift. Who, who's ever re-gifted? Raise your hand. Come on. Confess. Be honest. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, actually, I love re-gifting. I really do. I, I think it's, it's, it's good for my soul. It, it is. To have stuff given to me and it's like, oh, I don't keep this all to myself. I'm not going to share this. I was like, no, I've got an abundance. Why don't I just give some of this away to somebody else? Re-gifting is awesome. And that's what we get to do with our spiritual gift. It's not for us. <laughs> it's for the body of Christ. All right, I want to give you two mistakes to avoid as you re-gift your spiritual gift. Listen carefully now. This is very important. This is, uh, I've seen this over and over and over and over and over. Two mistakes to avoid. Number one, you expect others to have the same gift that you have. And because you have that gift, you have a burden. And you expect everybody else to have that same burden. And then when they don't have that burden, you get frustrated with them. You get annoyed with them. You even begin to get judgmental and critical because they don't have the same gift and burden that you have. Oh my goodness, this happens all the time in churches. This happens in marriages. This happens in families. We need to let people be who God has made them, the way he's gifted them. Don't expect others to have your gifting, your degrees of gifting, your mix of giftings. Huge mistake. Second mistake. We refuse to do anything for the Lord or for someone else unless it falls into our spiritual gift. <laughs> you know, it's the uh, hmm, going on a mission trip. Murray used this line at the training and you hide behind the hammer. You're on a mission trip to share Christ with other people and, and you have a dominant gift of serving, but you don't have a gift of evangelism and so you're just going to hide behind the hammer and never open your mouth to Christ. Well, that, no, that doesn't cut it. That, that's, that's a mistake. 
It's a mistake to not do anything for the Lord or for other people because it's not in your wheelhouse, not in your spiritual gifting. Many other examples could be multiplied. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you say, I don't know my gift. Well, I got, a, I got an answer for you. You need to discuss it. If you're a member of our church, you need to discuss it with your pastor elder. You need to get with your pastor elder and discuss your desire to discover your spiritual gift and let them help you, let them pray with you, let them take you to scripture, let them observe your life. Or find yourself a mature Christian friend and ask them to help you. This is the best way to discover your spiritual gift. So that's the eighth, uh, eighth gift then. We started on this journey with Christ himself, right? We started with the head. Christ himself, the greatest gift of all, we're going to end, number nine, with his body. Number nine is the gift of the church. The body of Christ. Isn't it amazing that the people of God are God's gift to the people of God? What is the church? True believers who self-identify as a church, who gather weekly to hear the word of God preached, sing God's praises, and practice baptism and communion in a context of loving fellowship. Where you have that, you have a church. It's not the building, it's the people, but it's a particular people gathered for a particular purpose who self-identify as a church. And there you have a local church. There's the universal church. Every Christian belongs to the universal church from the moment of salvation. It's invisible. It's both on earth and in heaven. And then there's local churches, local manifestations of the universal body of Christ. It is this local church that the New Testament primarily emphasizes. It is this local church that the New Testament is primarily written to in books like Corinthians and Galatians and Colossians and, to the, and Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches, local churches just like this church. True believers who identify as a church, who gather weekly to hear the word of God preached, to sing God's praises, to practice baptism and communion in the context of a loving fellowship. And it is this local church that every single Christian should desire, every single Christian should pursue should want in their life. You don't have to desire the universal body of Christ. You don't have to pursue it. It's automatic, right? You get saved, you're in it. But local churches, you have to do something about. You have to research, you have to find, you have to commit to. That is the focus of the New Testament. I've been a Christian for 37 years. KBC is my sixth church. Apparently, God saved the best for last. <laughs> You can bury me down by the creek. Please do. <laughs> it is a body, right? The body of Christ. The body of believers were the hands and feet of Christ. That reminds me of really two gifts from God. Life and the physical body is a gift from God, and we are to practice stewardship. Your life and your physical body is a gift from God. You only get one, and you need to be a good steward of it. You need to be mindful of it. You need to be habitually taking care of it. You need to promote its health. You need to promote its well-being. It's the only one you're ever going to get until the new body in time. Your spiritual life and your church body is also a gift from God and also requires a stewardship. It behooves us to promote the health of our physical body. It behooves us to promote the health of our spiritual body. We should be all about the well-being of both. Now, I want to give you two warnings as we are getting close to the end now. I want to give you two warnings regarding using or enjoying this particular gift. Number one, don't compare your church to other churches. That's like comparing your children to each other. It's not fair to us, and it's not fair to the other church. Don't compare this church to a past church. Don't compare this church to a present church. Just as every believer is unique in the eyes of God with unique talents and experiences and spiritual gifting, so you put them all together in local churches. Every single church is unique in the sight of God. 
And it's God's church. It's God's ministry. If we compare our church to other churches or any church to any other church, the outcome is going to be one of two things, most likely. The outcome is either going to be pride because we come out ahead or it's going to be a critical spirit because we don't like something about our church that church ABC has. And in other words, there is no good outcome when you start comparing. Our dear brother Billy Jean, who's with the Lord now, would say all the time, comparison is the thief of joy. And so it is. You start comparing children to one another, <laughs> spouses to other spouses, churches to other churches, and you're going down a path that is not good for anyone. Second warning. So we think about local churches, whether it's this one or any other local church that we might ever be part of someday. We need to seek to serve that church and we need to seek to assimilate, not dominate. Second warning related to the gift of using the church is assimilate, don't dominate. Let's just talk about this church for a few minutes. This church belongs to Jesus. Jesus owns this church. Jesus is the head of this church. And the Lord Jesus has put in place qualified shepherd elders to lead this church. Currently, we have eight. Every church inevitably experiences from time to time, I'd say every church, and this is probably true across the board of all time, every church inevitably experiences certain people who want to lead instead of follow. Certain people who want to control instead of submit. They want to set ministry and doctrinal direction of the church instead of serving the ministry and doctrinal direction set by the leadership. It's inevitable. I don't know a single church where this hasn't happened. These conflicts then will usually arise over two main areas. Either philosophy of ministry, how are we going to do church, or doctrine. Well, there's a third area. How are we going to spend the money? Those three areas are the primary areas where the conflicts will arise. We need to seek to serve and assimilate, not dominate. We had someone like this years ago in our church. Years ago, it was actually a deacon, kind of a self-called preacher, he had some theology that was very different from my own, and he didn't like me at all. He developed a complaining, grumbling attitude about everything. He was nitpicking of everything. And this went on for months, not long after I came here. And he began to hear the sermons and the drift of the doctrine and the direction of the philosophy of ministry, and I don't guess he agreed or liked any of it. But you've got to keep in mind, he also thought of himself as, uh, you know, kind of a would-be preacher, kind of a would-be leader of churches. This went on for weeks and for months. The, the, the tension was palatable whenever he was in the room with other elders and finally, it came to a head, and it came to a head because one of our other deacons who were serving on the deacon board at the time with this individual confronted him and stood up to him and said, if this is what you believe, and if this is what you want to do, then go do it. <laughs> Basically, he called his bluff. You think of yourself as a self-styled preacher and you think you know the Bible and you think you've got all the doctrine and everything figured out and you think we're way off base on all of these points. Well, well then just go start your own church. Well, he went, thankfully, but he didn't start a church. I mean, he, he joined a church that lined up with where he was. But that's what is sometimes needed in this Enterprise called the church, uh, a deacon who served with a fellow deacon confronting that person about the, the bitterness that was creeping into the body. That's one of many stories I could share in the history of this church. And every church has the same kind of list. <laughs> 
So the solution to all of this is that people need to come to churches with the attitude of serving and assimilating, not dominating. I will go a step further. This, this principle applies to the leaders as well. It applies to the Christ-called, Christ-appointed leaders of the church. We are to serve as slaves, not lords. We are to serve as shepherds of the sheep, not callous cowboys, you know, driving the cattle to slaughter. No. Even the leaders that God has designated are to serve humbly. All members then, including the leaders, including your pastors, including everyone who is in an office of leadership, all members need to understand our place and our position. All members need to seek to support and assimilate, never dominate, to learn to defer, not demand. Why? Because we all are God's gift to the church and for the church. So I close with these words. Let us love and be loved. Let us know and be known. Let us serve and be served. Let us pray for one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us forgive one another. Walking in a manner worthy of our calling with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen? Amen. So those are the nine gifts that I wanted to share with you this month of December. From Christ himself to the body of Christ. And I pray that you have been edified. I pray that you've been encouraged. I pray that your heart has soared in thinking about all that God has done for you and in through Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, so indebted to you for everything. I'm mindful of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. What do you have that you did not receive? So it is with us. Lord, thank you for the unity in our church. Thank you for the peace in our church. Thank you for the love of this church for its leadership, for each other. Lord, we thank you that we're not in the midst of power, strife, and battles and, and difficulties. We thank you for the season that we're in at Curvo Bible Church, a season of growth and edification and, and, and grace and love. We pray that these things would continue and increase. God, we pray that you would continue to use our church and our lives to draw more people to Christ, to sound doctrine, to the truth about the work of the Holy Spirit that is so often misunderstood and maligned and abused. Lord, I pray that we would be those who practice using our spiritual gifts. We discover and use because in that it comes a great joy to do what we're made to do. Father, we pray that we would be always mindful that this is our family, these are brothers and sisters, that we would openly, honestly communicate with each other, that we would not let divisions, bitterness spring up between us. We would cover a multitude of sins with love, that we would be a family that enjoys you and each other and being together. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.